discovered radioactivity, and beta activity was one of them. And so they observed the beta particles, which are now called electrons, of course, being emitted into the case. And this is a famous one with carbon-14 decays. And this is famous because it was used in radioactive dating and so forth. Um, but physicists studying these processes realized that the uh, energy distribution, rather than since it's a two-body final state, you would expect the energy of the electron to be a monoenergetic peak. Um, it's in fact a continuous spectrum that uh, extends up to what you would calculate to be the energy from a two-body decay, um, but has this kind of bell-shaped curve that I sketched here, measured in many experiments. Um, and the question is, where did the energy go? This just didn't want to give up on energy conservation that easily. Um, and uh, so in 1930, um, Pauli, uh, th this, this is a remarkable letter for many reasons. Uh, he wrote this kind of whimsical letter called Dear Radioactive Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, and uh, one of the remarkable things is, is, if you look down at the bottom, the real, this is all just uh, diversion. And the real reason he's writing this letter is that he's trying to get out of going to a conference in Tübingen. Uh, because he's indispens indispensable in Zurich at a wall. And I think, you know, uh, so this is one aspect of this letter that's very, looks very, probably not so unusual then, but today, you know, I, don't, I know a lot of physicists. I don't know any of that would give up a conference to go to the wall. It doesn't happen. <laughs> so uh, this was very unusual. But Pauli actually did one other very unusual, this was very unusual at that time, uh, and that is he, uh, made a whimsical suggestion that the reason for this continuous beta spectrum might be that there is a neutral particle also emitted with the beta particle that shares the energy. The neutral particle is not detected in the experiment and goes off. And that would explain the uh, observation. And uh, he called that particle a neutron, which of course we now know that's not true because, but the neutron had not been discovered yet. The neutron I think 1932, a couple years later. And um, so uh, he called it the neutron because that's kind of a word for neutral particle. And, uh, and so later, just after the neutron was discovered, Fermi said, well, that wasn't, that Pauli's particle was not the neutron, so we'll call it neutrino, which is accounted for neutral neutral particle. In any case, he made this uh, suggestion, uh, whimsically, of course, but uh, it's, uh, Basically, the idea of a light neutral particle also given off. Now, this was not so common back. I mean, this doesn't sound like it's a big deal now, because it's especially in particle physics, if you just look on the archive any day of the week, you'll see theorists predicting these particles that haven't been discovered. Okay? But this, this was not a common uh, uh, activity uh, for particle for theorists back in 1930. And in fact, after this, Pauli is said to have recorded to have said, I've done a terrible thing. I have postulated a particle that cannot be detected. And so, uh, you know, I, I think I know that many people here work at the LAC, and one of the major activities at the LAC is to look for particles that are not detected. <laughs> so it's really kind of interesting how the culture has changed so much over the years. In any case, it was quite some time, another 25 or six years before Neutrino, uh, which had been predicted, sorry, standing in the wrong place. <laughs> and um, so uh, the neutrino was discovered by Fred Minus and uh, Gene Callan uh, at uh, a reactor. And again, I'll be talking about reactor experiments, but just no, that they found were actually um, actually anti neutrinos uh, at uh, reactor in the 1950s, and this is a quote from uh, Fred Minus's Nobel lecture, where he points out that uh, clearly this process, if you believe in neutrinos, this process must exist, and just uh, people hadn't really calculated it in the early days. Uh, so then, people continued to work on these neutrinos uh, for many years in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, physicists learned how to produce uh, muon-type neutrinos in accelerator experiments, and they 
show that the muon neutrino were different from electron neutrino. Uh, they didn't produce electron type events, they produced muon type events. Electron neutrino was just the opposite. And uh, people got a Nobel Prize for that. 1968, uh, Ray Davis first uh, obtained the uh, anomalous uh, evidence for a solar neutrino, the deficit of solar neutrinos. And uh, this was something that was a puzzle for over 30 years, you know, recently solved, as I'll well mention later. Um, in the 1980s, and I, I got involved a little bit at this time, there was a new interest in neutrino oscillations. Um, and part of the reason was, I think, that dark matter had been uh, pretty well established to exist by looking at the, uh, um, at the rotation curves of uh, spiral galaxies. You could tell that there was dark matter out there. It's thought that an economical uh, explanation for the dark matter is it could be neutrinos that happen to have a mass, even though it was thought neutrinos were either very light or massless at the time. Uh, maybe if they had enough mass, they would, in fact, be the dark matter, and you wouldn't have to make new particles. Now, no, that's not true. You can get invented new particles that haven't been detected. But uh, this is this was uh, at the time uh, an, an attractive idea. So many neutrino oscillation experiments were mounted with the idea that that they would find uh, massive neutrinos that had enough mass to make this account for the dark matter. And that's kind of what has been uh, was going on for a while. But other than this, this kind of weird stuff, it wasn't clear what good the neutrinos, what they, what, what they were good for. And so there's actually a, a nice quote from uh, Feynman, who always has a good quote, right? All you have to do is imagine something that does practically nothing, because your son-in-law is part of it. A little bit dated, but it's classic, uh, big Feynman. Okay, so all of this kind of went on until 1998, when uh, it, was, it became very clear that the Super Kamiokande experiment in Japan had evidence for oscillation and that, that would require that um, at least one of the neutrinos has mass. And um, the way that experiment worked, uh, when you do neutrino physics in Japan, you, you put this at the top of the Earth, it's the most important place. And then uh, you realize that there are cosmic ray protons bombarding the Earth isotropically from all directions. And so there's an isotropic, and, and, and they create particles in the upper atmosphere. So the upper atmosphere is uniformly flowing in neutrinos all the way around the Earth. And some of them have to come only a short distance, like 20 kilometers to your detector, and some of them have to go thousands of kilometers to your detector. And uh, the ones that have to go thousands of kilometers to your detector might oscillate into other flavors, uh, whereas the near ones won't. And that is, in fact, uh, consistent with what they observed. They observed uh, for the muon-type neutrinos, for the downward going uh, neutrinos, they found basically something very close to what you expected from calculation, that's the blue, these are the data. And then, but for the upward going uh, uh, muon type uh, events, there was a deficit. And there was a smooth transition. And these, the red uh, curve here shows fit to the data of so the neutrino oscillations. So you can explain all of these data extremely well with neutrino oscillations. I think people became quite convinced at that point that the neutrinos were oscillating and had, um, had a finite mass. So how does this work? Let's go over the physics briefly. It's, it's really quite simple. So you have a source of, say, electron-type neutrinos, and they propagate a distance L. And this electron-type neutrino is actually a superposition of two mass hiding states, nu1 and nu2. And, uh, we designate their mass as m1 and m2. And uh, there's an important parameter that is the difference in squared masses, which is m1 squared minus m2 squared. And there's also another parameter, which is theta, the mixing angle associated with this superposition. So this electron and neutrino is created here as a superposition of two mass eigenstates. And as it propagates through space, the two mass eigenstates um, uh, evolve in time uh, slightly differently. The phase slips because they have different masses. So, and, and so they will eventually become uh, out of phase, and uh, the opposite uh, opposite combination, the orthogonal combination, of course, is a muon type neutrino. And so when you propagate through uh, time, or space in this case, you end up with a linear superposition 
of the electron type that you are trying to figure out, depending on how far away you are, and depending on what the delta m squared is, and the amount depends on the uh, mixing angle. So it's actually a simple, well, this shows the source of the detector. Um, the, uh, it's a simple quantum mechanical calculation to calculate the probability of observing the muon type neutrino after a distance l, you get this simple formula that depends on sine squared of twice this angle, and also depends on how far away you are, delta m squared, and the energy of the neutrino. Okay. And of course, the probability to remain an electron type neutrino off the fold. Survival probability is one minus that. And so you see that the amplitude of this oscillation is, uh, depends on the mixing angle theta. The frequency of the oscillation in space depends on this delta m squared. Or alternatively, if you're at a fixed distance and have a spectrum of neutrinos, you will have a, uh, an oscillation in the energy. Okay? But the frequency is controlled by the delta m squared. The important parameter for experiments is L over E. So basically, the frequency is delta m squared, and the experimental parameter is L over E. So you can do kind of the same experiment by doubling L and doubling the energy, or having L and having the energy. What matters is this ratio. So if you put in the numbers for one GeV of the typical atmospheric neutrino and tell 10 to the minus 3 eV squared, which is approximately the energy that we're in, or delta M squared that in fact fits the super K uh, data, then you find that you would need a distance of a thousand kilometers or so to see this oscillation. So uh, I want to come back to this uh, problem that Ray Davis found with the solar neutrinos explain that a bit and see how that comes into the story. So uh, to remind you that uh, it's really pretty simple to see that the, the sun is a ball of hydrogen gas which is compressed by gravity. If you compress the gas, of course, you can generate heat. Okay, we can all just calculate, estimate just from the gravitational uh, potential, that the, the potential energy of the hydrogen gas in the sun, how much energy, gravitational energy could have been transformed into you know the solar luminosity, and you take the ratio, you find that the sun should only shine, shine for about 20 million years. So, and it seems pretty clear that the sun's been shining significantly longer than that. And so, uh, how can that be? That when people long ago realized that there must be another source of energy powering the sun, other than just the gravitational attraction of the gas. And um, so they came up with the idea of nuclear fusion. And uh, the first step in this process is shown here, where you have, now I did it. I have another one, it's okay. Anyway, we'll keep going. Yeah. Uh, the first step in the process is the fusion of the two protons that make up the hydrogen gas into a deuteron plus a positron to conserve charge, and a neutrino, because you need to conserve left on the you need to have a neutrino. And this, of course, then becomes a uh, weak interaction process by the fact that the neutrinos only have neutrinos only have uh, weak interactions, but this will make energy, and you can then calculate from from this, and uh, you know the rate of this, how uh, how much uh, how much energy you can create, and you can easily then establish uh, account for the energy generation of the sun. Now there's a series of nuclear reactions that generate other neutrinos and higher energies that are easier to detect. And some of the first calculations were done at Caltech in the early 1960s. It was John McCall uh, and uh, Willie Fowler uh, were the instigators of this. And uh, that this is the first kind of serious calculation of what became known as the boron-8 neutrino flux, which is one of the reactions further down the chain of uh, fusion reactions in the sun. And um, these are the, uh, the uh, neutrinos that, in fact, Ray Davis set out to find in his famous experiment with the glory tank in the Home State Mine in South Dakota. But uh, so over the years, of course, John McCall became uh, really famous for calculating all the fluxes of all these different kinds of neutrinos. And here you can see the boron-8 is a lot weaker in terms of flux than the PPs, but they're at much higher energies where it's easier to detect. Reaction products. And this shows you the thresholds of the various experiments that were done over the year. 
years. So the good news is the neutrinos are there. In fact, we're in neutrinos. There's fusion happening with the sun. And uh, Ray Davis did indeed see the first evidence that there were neutrinos coming from the sun. Although all you could tell was that there were extra counts in the detector, as you might expect. Uh, the Super Kamiokande experiment actually went one step further, which I think is very nice. Because it's a water Sherenkov detector, you can, by looking at the cone of the Sherenkov light, point back to where the neutrino came from. And you can do that, you can form an image of the sun using neutrino. So this is rather, I think this is a remarkable image because the, uh, you have to go deep underground to get rid of the cosmic ray background. <laughs> and it's certainly very dark <laughs> under there. Uh, and you're looking at the neutrinos from the sun, not the, uh, not the light from the sun. Um, and uh, indeed, what's interesting about these neutrinos is they come from the center of the sun, whereas the light that we see uh, comes from the surface of the sun. So you're really probing the center of the sun where the fusion reactions are taking place. So um, in, this, in this picture of all the the sun is just a small dot in this picture, <laughs> actually, because the resolution of the experiment is not very good. So the picture is a little bit deceptive, but I, I still think it's a real triumph to be able to image the sun in neutrinos. It's quite, quite nice. Okay, so then the bad news, as many of you, all of you probably heard, is that uh, the experiments, all of them, showed a deficit, as first seen by Ray Davis, but also seen uh, by the Water of Kamioka and Super Kamiokande experiments and uh, the Gallium experiments. Um, but the experiments, the ratios were not the same in each case, and that was kind of a clue that many people thought, well, the, the sun can't actually reproduce this pattern. Unless maybe one of the experiments is a little bit wrong, they can't all be wrong. It didn't seem that's possible. Um, so uh, there were still holdouts that there's something wrong with the sun or whatever, but certainly approximately half of the and the, the conclusive uh, demonstration that it was flavor change that was happening in the sun uh, came from the snow experiment, Sudbury neutrino experiment, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in Sudbury, Canada. And they had a very deep mine, and they made a large, uh, a large detector that was heavy water, a Cherenkov detector out of heavy water. And heavy water has deuterium in it instead of protons, B2O instead of H2O. And uh, for a deuteron, you can have a neutral current process where the neutrino breaks up the deuteron into a proton and a neutron, and then continues on. It's called a neutral current process because the electron doesn't change uh, uh, its electric charge. Uh, this is an amazing experiment also. You take 1,000 tons of heavy water, put it deep underground, and look for neutrons. Who would have thought that that would have anything to do with detecting neutrinos from the sun? But if you can eliminate all of the radioactivity and other backgrounds in this experiment, you can actually do a very clean measurement of this process uh, in such a detector. And I think it's an amazing experimental feat. They pulled it off and made a measurement of the total. The neutral current process has the nice feature that it doesn't matter what kind of old neutrino it is. So if the electron neutrino turns into a muon neutrino, it's OK. You still will measure it. And so this will really measure the total number of neutrinos. All the other experiments measure just electron-type neutrinos. And indeed, this is the prediction of, uh, of the standard solar model. And here you can see the, uh, the measurement is, is actually quite consistent with that. And there's no longer a deficit to look back for the two. So uh, the, we now understand this in terms of what are called matter-enhanced oscillations, uh, or MSW effect after these gentlemen. And uh, the way it works is, in addition to the standard oscillation of neutrinos in empty space, shown by this term in the Hamiltonian called the vacuum part of the Hamiltonian, there's also this matter effect. And that comes about because Electron-type neutrinos, as opposed to muon or tau neutrinos, uh, have, in, in addition to um, the neutral current events, that one, the neutral current interactions with the electrons in the sun as they emerge, they also have charge current interactions. So they have a different interaction potential. That gives you a different, another term in the Hamiltonian only for electron-type neutrinos. And this causes a resonant enhancement of the flavor change of the 
prenups. And uh, when you go through a calculation, it kind of looks like this. So this is as a function of the electron density. So the center of the sun is here, the surface of the sun is there. So in the center of the sun, you create electron type neutrinos. <coughs> as they propagate out, the mass of this effective mass of this particle, which as defined by this Hamiltonian, decreases. And also the flavor content of this uh, object decreases, or the state vector decreases, the changes to become a new two, one of the mass eigen states, effectively. And the uh, new mu would have done this, but of course we are following this path by uh, making electron type neutrinos. So that predicts as a function of, this will be a function of energy because of this one over energy in this term here. And you can see that uh, as a function of energy, uh, you can see this is a survival probability coming out of the sun. And so you can predict those three different types of experiments would in fact have different survival probabilities uh, because of the different energy thresholds of the experiments. And uh, one can explain all of the data extremely well with this hypothesis. And that's shown here, where the closed circles are the experimental data, and the open circles are combined best fit using other neutrino oscillation experiments to, to find the delta m squares in the data. And you can see that you get very, very good explanation of all the different experiments that we've done up until that point. So that all looks very good, except all of this evidence we have comes from these neutrinos that kind of come from the sky. And uh, Willie Fowler got his Nobel Prize for uh, the process, understanding the process of nucleosynthesis of the elements and how the elements are created in stars. And the whole philosophy was go into the laboratory, measure cross-sections, energy levels, and properties of nuclei so that you know enough nuclear physics that you can calculate what's going to happen in the star. Okay? Don't look at the star and try to learn nuclear physics. <laughs> and the way you like to say it is that there's something fascinating about science. One gets such wholesale returns of conjecture from a trifling investment of fact, which is a quote from uh, Mark Twain. And uh, so with his philosophy always about the experimentalists to try to eliminate the word trifling which is never going to cover the fact of nature and uh, explain these, these trifling things that you get from uh, imagining uh, explanations for actual physical phenomena. So if you take all of these essentially astrophysical data with their explanations, I think that these gentlemen agree that we need a laboratory experiment to really establish that to understand what's going on. And so um, at the time, they were going on, and it became uh, a greater interest to pursue the subject of studying uh, neutrino oscillations with nuclear reactors. And the way this works is you can take, so this is a, a diagram from a, a, one of the famous experiments, the show experiment. We have a nuclear power plant, for example, with maybe a couple of nuclear reactors, and nuclear reactors will generate anti electron type neutrinos. The reason is that uranium uh, that is fissioning is very neutron rich compared to the fission products. And so there are, in the fission products, there are extra neutrons. And so it's those nuclei like to beta decay, just like a neutron. And when a neutron beta decays, it makes an anti-neutrino. And so those fission products generally gener make these anti-neutrinos. And I'll show you that you can, you can calculate how many of these come out of a reactor quite readily. You go a distance away, say a kilometer or two, and you have to build a large detector where the anti-neutrinos will interact in the neutrino target. What is tr traditionally used is a proton target. You take anti-neutrinos plus a proton, make a positron. It's called inverse beta decay and a neutron. And uh, I'll show you that not only can you measure the flux by measuring the rate of this reaction, but you can also measure the energy spectrum of these neutrinos. So how does the detection signal work in these experiments? Here's your electron anti-neutrino interacting with a proton. It makes a positron, which has some kinetic energy. So the positron stops by uh, uh, losing energy through ionization of the medium, and then annihilates on an electron, making two 511 gamma rays, which also contribute. This all happens in a very short amount of time. So this is called the prompt energy, the total amount of energy, uh, which is positron kinetic energy plus twice the rest of that. 
Um, and by uh, conservation of energy, that prompt energy has to be actually the new original neutrino energy, except for the recoil energy of the neutron you created. And then there's a 0.8 MeV associated, the over there, associated with uh, the difference in mass between the proton and neutron, and also the, the electron, positive charge of rest mass. So uh, basically, this, and this recoil energy is very small, 10 kilovolts or so. And if you just make an average correction for it, that's quite good. And so by measuring this prompt energy, you can determine the neutrino energy. It's very important to understand that. And then after the neutron rattles around and we call it thermalizing in the medium, it will capture on another proton. And typically this takes a couple hundred microseconds and gives you a 2.2 MeV gamma ray that you can detect as a delayed coincidence. And this signature is very unique. It makes it very hard for background to mimic the signal if your detector is quiet enough. Um, other experiments also use an enhanced version of the neutron capture used by doping the material with gadolinium. And uh, the gadolinium has a very large capture cross-section, so it shortens the capture time. And it also has a, uh, a larger energy releasing than you need. So it really enhances the signal. Now the flux of the antineutrinos from the reactor comes from the fission products, and the fission products come from the uh, original isotopes that are fissioning. And this shows, uh, as a function of time in a reactor, the fissions per second of different isotopes. And you'll notice that there are, uh, there are a lot of fissions in U-235. That's why you would eventually be able to do U-235, because that gives you, uh, that's what really makes the reactor go. Um, but it decreases with time as you burn up that fuel. And you'll notice there's an increase in plutonium-239. And this comes from uh, neutron captures on the neutron U-238. Uh, in, in the reactor, and so the U-239 is being created all the time uh, as a function of time, and you can see that growing. So all of these isotopes vary a little, vary with time, um, but each of those isotopes has a distinct spectrum from its fission products. They're all slightly different, but they're not too different. Um, and you can measure them largely through measuring the, uh, by, by inducing uh, a fission with neutrons from the neutron beam, thermal neutron beam, and then measuring the beta decays in the uh, products, and um, then converting the, that spectrum from a, a, from a electron spectrum to an anti neutrino spectrum. But what you find, uh, kind of, you know, even though these are changing as a function of time, it's well known you get about 200 MeV per fission. That's what gives you, that's what makes the reactor generate energy. So for every fission, you get 200 MeV. Because of the neutron-rich nature of uranium and plutonium and so forth compared to the fission products, you get on average six neutrinos, actually anti-neutrinos, per fission. And so if you don't have an MeV per fission, energy per fission, and you know the number of neutrinos per fission, you can take the ratio and get the number of neutrinos per unit energy, which will, which will quote as gigawatt thermal seconds. So if you know the power of the reactor, you can calculate the number of neutrinos per second. That is so it's really quite that simple. And then there are a few percent corrections. Okay? And if you have the formulas for the paper, you can calculate the actual spectrum. So here's the spectrum. Here's the, um, the cross section for the inverse beta decay. And your event rate will go as the product of them. And you see you get this bell shaped curve, peaked at about 4 MeV neutrino energy. You need 1.8 MeV anti-neutrinos to reach the threshold of the reactor. So neutron is heavier than the proton, and you've got to create a positive okay. So measurements have been done uh, looking for neutrino oscillations, not finding them at, at closer distances. And so this is one uh, from the Goskin reactor in Switzerland. It's 45.9 meters. And here are the data, and you can see the predictions of the two different methods of calculating the spectrum. And there's no fudging normalization or anything here. These are absolute calculations, and you can see that the agreement is really quite good. So the message is that these, that these reactors are calibrated sources of neutrinos at the one or two percent level. So then the show experiment uh, was started at around the time of the super K results, and, and they were looking for the same effect uh, by going at about a kilometer from these French reactors building this uh, neutrino uh, detector, uh, this formula, yeah. Um, 
And here's the result. It's an upper limit, so we know that the answer is to the left of this curve. Okay, it's an exclusion curve. Um, actually, and this is nice, this graph also shows the Taylor Verde result, which is local data, uh, which is almost as good, but not quite as sensitive as the show experiment. And the super K experiment would have predicted something in this range. So you can see that they ruled out most of it. And we now know from an experiment I'll mention later called Minos that this delta m squared is actually very well determined now to uh, pretty high accuracy. Uh, and so we now know that the answer is somewhere in this red line. <laughs> so that's what we're looking for. That's what's left. Uh, but uh, the show experiment could not find it. And one of the things that's happening now, as you see, is there are new experiments trying to push down into this region. Of course, need to be more precise and you know, more difficult. But meanwhile, uh, about eight years ago, we started a countland experiment in Japan. And this was to study uh, the uh, uh, neutrino oscillation effects that was hypothesized for the solar neutrinos. And uh, the idea there was to increase the baseline beyond one kilometer by a very aggressive amount of 200. Even if there are no neutrino oscillations, although you can lose back to 200 squared plus, so the experiment gets back to the four, 10 to the fourth partner. Um, so uh, you need to build a much larger detector. So we went from 10 tons to a kiloton, <laughs> back to 100. Still hurts. Uh, such a big detector would, would count like mad at the surface because of cosmic rays, so it has to go deep underground. So we actually went to the original Kamiokande cavity near Kamiokande. And uh, this shows one of our sources of uh, anti-neutrinos, which is Takashi Tazaki power station. It's the largest one in the world, 25 kilowatts thermal, and seven nuclear reactor cores in this power station. But that's just one of them. Japan has a lot of nuclear power stations. And you can kind of see every one of these, of course, is generating neutrinos with flux going like one over the distance squared. So the closest ones matter the most. And you can kind of draw, this is where Camland can be open line is, you can kind of draw a 200 kilometer circle, you can kind of see how that comes about. And, you, and all of the reactors that matter are at a, kind of a fixed distance of 200 kilometers. Uh, you have to account for all the others, uh, nearby, even a few in South Korea uh, contribute a few percent. But, uh, but we use the entire nuclear power industry in Japan as a neutrino source. And like my stockbroker friend likes to say, all the neutrinos come from your charge. And actually, he thinks it's a pretty big joke. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we made a measurement. This is one of the more recent uh, plots of the energy spectrum that we measured. Um, and uh, you can see the black points are in fact our experimental data. And this dashed curve, the black dashed curve, is what we would expect if there were no neutrino oscillations. Very substantial deficit of neutrinos, and you'll notice that the deficit is in fact energy dependent and it's on energy. Remember that formula, sine squared delta m squared L over E. So what we can do is plot 